my name is Officer James Savota. I'm the City Wide PIP Coordinator. And uh, on and the entire city of Houston, we want to thank you for coming out today to interact with the citywide PIP meeting. Uh, we have a very full agenda tonight. Um, so it's very important, uh, you know, the chief will be hanging around after the meeting and all the commanders will be hanging around. If you have a divisional PIP concern or issue, uh, it's better to get with that division commander, PIP officer, and I know the chief hangs around after the meeting, get with them after the meeting if it is a divisional meeting, not necessarily a citywide meeting. Uh, tonight we had some really great um, donations of food, and of course we had uh, responsible for some of the food is the Central, East Side, Downtown, and Kingwood. So we want to thank you all for uh, making those donations. And uh, could I get Doug Griffin to come up here, please? I know Doug and the union, they're always so generous of allowing us to have the citywide PIP meetings here um, on their dime. So Doug, thank you. You want to say a few words? I want, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this, you guys are really our eyes and ears on the streets. We appreciate you coming out. Uh, I did an interview the other day with 740, and their primary focus was what can we do to get involved? And I told them, this is where it starts. Uh, working Southeast my whole career, I used to go to the pit meetings, and that's where I got my best information. Because y'all know what's going on in the streets. Y'all are the ones that see it every day. So we appreciate you taking the time to come out of your busy day to come up here and help us do what we need to do. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Doug. And of course, for this meeting, this is the very first time we have a wonderful Spanish-speaking group that's being translated. So we want to thank you for coming out today. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Officer Don Vo. He works at the Community Affairs. Uh, he has been a very uh, ally to the PIP program. Don, you want to come up and kind of introduce yourself and talk, okay. talk about a few things? Hi. Thank you, thank you James. Yes, um, my name is Officer Don Vo. I'm from Community Affairs. And today, like James says, we have a Spanish interpreter uh, in the back. So while I am speaking, he is interpreting into Spanish for our Spanish listeners in person. So let's just give them a round of applause. <laughs> this is the first time for our pit citywide pips, so I really appreciate appreciate them, and we can increase um, attendance with this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Um, okay, next we'd like to introduce our citywide chairperson, Joan Bouchard, and we want to thank all of the divisional leaders in this room that come from different parts of Houston. Uh, this is a great resource. The chief is here to give a state of the department address, so uh, thank you all for coming out. Joan, you have the floor. Welcome. Is everybody okay? You have nice food to eat this evening. And uh, don't eat too much, though. <laughs> you have to make sure it gets shared with everybody else. Welcome to the Chief Citywide BIP meeting. And we're back in the in-person attendance, and we're live streamed also for those community members who can't make it here. And I hope you didn't have too much rain I thought I was going to float in Memorial Park and really worried a little bit when I drove over. Some of the nation's police departments have been the focus in the news, as you can imagine. And we in Houston proudly have in place the Positive Interaction Program. This is to promote positive relationship with every member of this community. And it is you and your community, and you have to take credit for this program working. So give yourselves all a big hand for that. We now have, I know he's here, I saw him. You're hiding. Officer Vince Johnson, he's chaplain. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Why don't you take this opportunity and just tell the person next to you, sitting or standing, welcome back. Social media helps, live stream helps, but it's nothing like being in person when you can engage the person next to you, when you can ask the questions that you want to ask in person. So we're definitely blessed to be back in this place today. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We ask that you let this meeting be held decently and in order. We ask that something be done or said to encourage, educate, and inspire. We thank you for the meal that we are partaking in. We ask that it be nourishment for our bodies. And when we depart from this particular location, we ask for traveling grace as we return back to our various destinations. We thank you for the leadership of the Houston Police Department, and we ask that you just continue to bless every officer, all the way to the street officer, all the way up to the chief of police. Please keep everybody safe. We ask that you watch over the first responders in the city of Houston, and we ask that you just continue to keep a hedge of protection around each and every one of us. We thank you for allowing us to gather again, and we ask that you keep us safe, and we ask that you keep us healthy. This is your servant's prayer. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. I am speaking slowly because of the um, translation in the back of the room so they don't miss anything. I haven't lost it yet. <laughs> I'll let you know when I do. <laughs> Recently, a lot of communities have discovered this program, as you all know, because we announce this every time. And they want to know how to get involved and how this works. It's very easy. You just show up at the divisional meeting and you work from there. In addition, there are also police departments nationally that have contacted us. They've heard about the success here, and it really is the best kept secret in this town. Not many people know about it unless they have a problem or a concern, and then they find out about us, the PIP. This is a very, very good model that can be used in any city across this country. The success has been expressed by the following statement. We are a dedicated group of citizens and business owners working together with the dedicated chief and command staff, interacting together to reduce crime. That's the main object. We would like to think that all of you, thank you all for your participation to gain the growth and the recognition from other cities and police departments. And that's why the, I believe you get the calls. They've heard about us. And I'm going to repeat what Officer Sabota said before. If you have a divisional concern or an issue, please get with your divisional commander. This is going to be a long meeting today, so snuggle in, and here we go. Okay, we're going to start out with the Department's Crime Analysis Division. This is the citywide crime analysis report to our members. And this evening, we have Commander Matthew May, he will provide us with this report. And I didn't know I was standing next to him. <laughs> Good evening. I hope everybody's doing well. I uh, hope everybody's fairly dry after the torrential downpour. So uh, just a caveat when we start here. Um, the crimes that I'm showing, they're not the official numbers for the Houston Police Department. This is going to be reported crime. It, I'm going to give you a URL if you're looking for the actual official crime stats for the uh, Houston Police Department. Now, those are going to be investigations. It's not a big distinction, but just so you're aware. So this is what we're looking at so far this year. Um, despite some of the press coverage, murders are up, but a majority of our violent crimes are down. Also, auto thefts are up, but uh, most of our nonviolent crimes are also down. Uh, that's a trend that, luckily, it's in the city of Houston. It may not be nationwide, but we appreciate it. 
Now this is all crime. Um, what you see on the top is the trend for the last two and a half years. What you see on the bottom, the orange line is 2020, the blue line is 2019, and the green line is uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. So that's a, even though it bounces up and down, it's a general downward trend for all crime. And you can see that while we had a, a lowering of crime in the month of February, uh, it's starting to trickle up. That, that's a general trend we see every summer. Uh, violent crime, on the other hand, is generally trending up. Uh, you can see right now we're between 2019 and 2020 as far as the crime trend goes, but we're actually seeing a decrease, which is a little unusual compared to what we're usually seeing in the summer, and we're hoping that trend continues. So aggravated assaults, um, this is lion's share of our violent crime. Uh, unfortunately, that's tr uh, trending up right now. Murders, they've been up, but they seem to be leveling out. I know they're getting a lot of coverage in the press. Um, we're hoping that uh, we continue to see that leveling out period. Robbery has been trending down. Um, and very appreciative of that. I worked in robbery for two years, <laughs> and you always want to see that number going down. Now for violent crime, uh, that's generally trending down for the last two and a half years. You can see it's trending up a little bit, but it's still below 2019, or yeah, 2019 and 2020. Uh, auto thefts, they're the one uh, exception to nonviolent crime. Uh, those have been trending up. Um, that's, in fact, that's what uh, some of the speech we're going to have this evening is going to be about. BMVs, uh, they're trending between 2019 and 2020. <laughs> Burglaries of buildings, they spiked during COVID. Um, and for our crime trends, COVID 2020, we're almost to the point of really not using that to establish crime trends because it was so unusual. But um, so we had a spike in the burglaries of buildings, but it is uh, trended down. Burglaries of habitations are also down. Uh, fraud. Um, Fraud's a tricky one, uh, but so far uh, it's trending down. Uh, we see a spike every now and then. Um, it's one of these days we'll get somebody up here to describe fraud uh, before I go off on a tangent. Uh, thefts are down. And this is the department's webpage. If you're looking for the official stats, uh, you can go to it, www.houstontext.gov slash police. And down there in the bottom circle where it says crime statistics, you can find the official crime stats for the Houston Police Department. Does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will have our Chief of Police, Troy Fenner. Are we ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. So uh, I'm not the boss of the PIP. Let's get that straight. I may be the chief, but that's the boss of the PIP. And she said many times, we got a long program, long program. So I get the key. I want to be really quickly and uh, just go over a few key points and uh, say a few things. I, I want to first of all thank our great citizens. It's raining. It's Tuesday evening. And y'all love us enough and you love the community enough to be out here and that means a lot to me. Also, the men and women on the front line, all the way up to our upper leadership, thank y'all for the support. Thanks for continuing to charge forward, even when people are saying negative things. I think I said last time, I want all our citizens to know one thing. Unlike some other cities, our police department, our men and women on the front line, even during COVID, our felony arrests continue to peak up. So that's a good thing. So, I, you know, other parts of the criminal justice system have to do their part. And I want to thank some of them right now because I told you we were having those behind the scene meetings and they've been pretty productive. Um, you heard our county judge and our commissioner get up and have a press conference just a few weeks ago. They recognize what's going on. Chief Bradford, thanks for being here with the DA's office. Thank you. And uh, I saw our fire department here as, as, as well. So thank you all and I wanted to acknowledge that. But um, those meetings are going well. We didn't get into 
this crime wave overnight, we're not going to get out of it overnight. But what I'm so convinced about is the spirit of this great city and the spirit of the men and women who serve on, the, on that front line. We're going to continue to work together to solve our problems, but we have to do it together. I said last time, and I'm going to say it today, we get nowhere when we start throwing stones at one another, okay? Let's speak the truth. Let's hold one another accountable. None of us are perfect, but when we're communicating, good people communicating with good police officers, we solve major problems. It's not going to come with us being negative, okay? So let's do that. But nothing's wrong with us being honest and holding one another accountable. Just a, key, a few key points. Road rage. I'm getting so many calls about that, okay? And it's sad. Um, I want to let you know, and I'm going to speak the truth. Some of these so-called road rages are not road rages. It's individuals that's targeting and taking out their beef on the streets. It's somebody that's coming from a, a, a drug deal or something, and then the, the suspects are coming after them and it's targeted. Now, that does not mean that that's all of them. We saw the news. The 17-year-old the, the young man that's coming from the Astros game, he and his father, and I spoke to him. That is just a random, violent event that should never happen in our city. So what are we doing about it, Chief Fenner? Let me tell you something. Uh, Chief Saddlewhite and some of our other chiefs and other leaders, uh, we formed a task force with all the other agencies in, in our area. It's going to be marked units, and it's going to be unmarked units. We made an arrest just the other day. Some of our unmarked units saw this car driving erratically and, and aggressively, and we got that car stopped, got some guns out of there. So that's one that we probably prevented. So you'll see that. And with our violent crime, we're going to keep doing what we're doing with our task force, with the men and women on our front line. So uh, just join with us. Be vigilant out there. Um, I don't want you just think, thinking, hey, the whole sky is falling and Houston is the worst city. No, it's not. Still a good, peop a good city with good people in here, and we're going to work together. But be vigilant. Be smart. Pick your times when you're going out to shop. Why are you getting gas or going to a convenience store after dark when you don't have to? So let's w watch out for one another and be smart. But I told Joan I was going to take about 10 minutes. And I probably got about two or three minutes left for a few questions. And I'm going to be here on the end because I want to bring up our auto theft division. And I think it was one more auto dealers. Metal theft. Metal theft I'm sorry. A lot of great information. So uh, I want to get out the way, but I will be here. Yeah. First question. Chief Fenner, my name is Fred Woods. Woods. Doing all right. Yeah. First measure acquaintance at the Northeast. Pit meeting on yes. June 10th. Mm -hmm. You made me a promise, and I'm just here to hold you accountable to that promise. Thank you. Uh, a, a yeah. man overdosed at that house that I told you about tonight. Okay. Uh, and I want to ensure that your officers, I know they do a good job, I know they wear the badge mm -hmm. and pride, uh, that they're doing something about it, that there's action. Okay. You know, I started my question off, or my, my last time I spoke to you off with response time. Yes. So I want to make sure that you're responding to what we discussed. Okay. That's, that's fair. Um, I want to get uh, some, some information from you. Uh, I've, I've talked to uh, some of our DRT officers. want to make sure um, if, if what we're doing is not working, we've got to go to plan B. Because I want all our citizens to understand, when, when, especially when I say something, um, I hold myself accountable. Now, sometimes things don't change overnight, but as long as you're standing with us and you communicate with us, we should be serving you, and that's any citizen. So uh, I, I want to hit you out afterwards, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Next question. Boy, I'll tell you this. Yes. Yes, tomorrow, Bill. Yes. Good evening. Uh, thank you all. First, first off and foremost, for having citywide PIP, uh, it means a lot to us to be able to talk to you one on one and face to face. I had a question about your DRT team. Mm -hmm. How do you all prioritize which establishments you visit? Well, it's going to be really, to me, complaint-driven, but it also, also should be about our DRT officers out in the area, patrolling the areas and knowing what's going on. But definitely, um, it's, it's, it's mostly, to me, complaint-driven. 
If somebody sees something and they're telling us about a situation that's unsafe or whatnot, we should be uh, enforcing that. But um, um, please let us know what's going on, especially DRT problems, so we can respond to it. And if you're not getting the proper response, um, you should take that up with, with your commander first. And uh, if that's not getting to it, hit my office, call me, come by, send me an email. Okay? It was the one more hand over there, or was that it? Yes, ma'am. Point for two. Yeah, okay. Is that it? If so, I'm going to get out the way and we'll bring up the next uh, presenter, okay? Thank y'all. Okay, he's a longtime City of IPIP member and volunteer with the department and is a board member with the Houston Citizens Police Academy Alumni Association. You have to really shorten that. Uh, you're right, HCP AAA. Mike Weindorf. <laughs> Hi everybody. As Joan said, I'm Mike Weingart. I'm representing the Houston Citizens Police Academy Alumni Association, or HCP AAA. How many of our graduates are in the audience? Please rise. All right. Now, what I like to say is if you like PIP, you'll love the HCPA. And we have some classes that are starting this fall. On the table next to where you register, I've got a flyer that gives you the information. Um, and there's also a brochure. So we'd like to encourage you to come join us. My other reason for being here today, the, our organization's project this year has been called Hydrate the Officer. What we've done so far is contributed 69 pallets of water to all the divisions. How many of the officers here have had the opportunity to enjoy the water? <laughs> okay. Now just to give you an idea, there's 2,016 bottles in a pallet, and that's 139,000 bottles, or 1,668,000 ounces of water. Now, this costs money. So what we do, we've got a form in the back. If for anybody, their, their, their civic organization, their company, or individually, anywhere from 10 cents for a bottle to um, $1,800 for 10 pallets. We'll take anything in between. And we've got a little bucket there uh, for if you'd like to leave a, a donation toward this. So thank you very much. Okay, next we have uh, Chief Innovation Office of Metro. I saw you there, well, all of a sudden you're up here. Kim Williams, and she would like to uh, briefly outline the, and I'm going to read this one, dedicated bus line project, so we don't get this wrong. And uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you and good evening. I want to thank Officer Sabata for fitting us into the agenda and then Joan for allowing me a few moments to speak. I will be very brief. As Joan mentioned, my name is Kim Williams and I'm with Houston Metro. I'm also joined by my colleague, Linda Trevino, in the back in the red-orange sweater. Uh, we just wanted to make you aware of a project that we're working on in downtown Houston. Many of you may be aware that we currently have bus-only diamond carpool lanes in existence in downtown but they are not in the best of shape. And in an effort to have a uh, better travel experience for you and safer intersections, you will start to see what we call red lanes. We'll start out on uh, Travis Street, and once we complete that, then we'll move over to Milam, and then we'll start to work towards the other bus lane streets moving out into the park and ride system. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, as you start to see those lanes come up, what they are and what they're doing, um, it's not a new lane or a new service. It's just simply us refreshing the lanes that are there and hopefully creating a safer travel experience and a faster one for those of you traveling in and out of downtown. Uh, my card is in the back in case you have any questions. And I do have this diagram here. I know it's hard to see, but I'll leave these in the back if you are just interested to see what this might look like once they're um, laid out on the ground. With that, are there any quick questions I can take? Or otherwise, I'll be in the back if you'd like to. So. Is this only for downtown? Currently, yes, um, because we have those diamond lanes and the carpool lanes already in existence there. And so we'll start there in downtown. 
if they work as well as we expect, then we'll start looking at other corridors. All right, thank you so much for your time. Our uh, presentation this evening is the police department's metal theft unit and auto theft unit. We have a double this evening. I told you, snuggle up in your chair, we're gonna be here a while. And this presentation will include information with crime prevention tips on how to protect your vehicles regarding the famous catalytic converter problem. And I'm just checking other things. And metal theft, which I did not know about. This is from your homes and your businesses. Is that like the air conditioning units that they've been stealing? OK. And the first one will be Sergeant Tracy Hicks, followed by Officer Oscar Gamez. Thank you. Wow, what a crowd. Um, the last time I did this, last year, uh, I did it in a dark room when there was three camera people and that was it because of COVID. It's awkward. I like talking in front of people. Um, I'm Sergeant Hicks. I work in auto theft. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm so glad we're back in person seeing, you know, a lot of people that I've, I've known for many years now, actually. Um, when I got here this evening, I texted my wife and I said, I said, I actually texted her and she said, I said, there's a lot of stars in this room. So everybody in here has a star on their shoulder is, is here. And I said, I'm the only one that's not in uniform. I said, I hope I'm really funny tonight. She said, no, hopefully I'm not too funny. So, but I did wear pants tonight for you guys, um, which that might be explained for some of you. Some of you, I don't need to explain it. I'm usually in shorts and I'm dressed like a homeless guy when I do my speeches. But um, I, I put on pants for you guys. Tonight, I'm actually going to talk, I could talk about auto theft, my passion forever. I've been in auto theft 15 years. Um, and, and when you saw the crime stats, you know, they all, everybody always talks about the, the murders, the robberies, and the rapes, and that's kind of the important thing, things you see in the news. What, I don't know if anybody noticed it, because I always look. When you looked at the nonviolent crimes and it said auto theft, it was at like 18,000. You know, and people talk about like, oh, there was four murders, but there was 18,000 cars broken into. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is kind of the hot button topic. Last year, during COVID and even the year before, uh, my commander told me, no matter what you're doing, every time you're in front of people, talk about leaving guns in cars. Please, please, please stop leaving guns in cars. We had uh, close to 2,800 guns stolen out of cars last year. And so that was, no matter what you do, every time you're on the news, you always mention that, try to throw that in there. So I did. January of this year, she calls me up and she says, stop everything you're doing and can, everything you're going to do is catalytic converters now. I'm like, what? what? What about catalytic converters? And so I started reading. I had to become an expert real fast, learning like what a catalytic converter is, why is it such a problem right now, and what's going on. Now, if you guys have been watching the news, you've seen it. Um, for the people that don't know, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a brief lesson of what a catalytic converter is. What your catalytic converter is, it's, it's part of your exhaust system on your car. When um, the exhaust comes off the engine, the first, when it gets under your car, the first thing it's gonna go through is your catalytic converter. And it, and it looks like a small muffler. Every car has one, some have two, three, or even four of them. And they're all different amounts of value. When the, what these things do is, is they clean the exhaust um, before it goes out into your muffler and out into the atmosphere. So what's in these things is what's making them valuable there's three precious metals inside of every catalytic converter there's platinum we've all heard of platinum there's palladium and there's rhodium rhodium right now is about twenty eight thousand dollars an ounce there's not a lot of it in there um, the palladium is around eighteen thousand dollars an ounce um, and if you and you know in comparison gold's what sixteen hundred dollars an ounce so you can imagine there's, there's minuscule amount of this in these catalytic converters. And, and the reason why these metals have exploded is the, the rhodium, for example, is only mined in South America. And with COVID, they kind of um, you know, slowed down production. So the production kind of cut in half. And what happened is until about three years ago, 
China didn't put catalytic converters on their cars. Well, their pollution got bad, and they decided, you know what? We're going to start putting catalytic converters on our cars. So if you add a billion new cars into the market and you cut the supply in half, that's where we're at right now. So until somebody designs some sort of a system that can do the same thing, we're going to have this problem with these three metals because every single car manufacturer in the entire world is trying to get their hands on as much of these metals as they can to produce more of these catalytic converters. Now your car doesn't need to have it, but to pass inspection here in Harris County, they, you know, they put a thing in your, in your pipe and they will tell you you don't pass, so you have to have one. So what's happening is crooks have figured out that, well, gee, if I just cut these off and take them to the metal recyclers and I can get cash for them. Some of these are worthless. I mean, they're worth $20, $30, $40. And some of them are up to almost $1,500. So there are certain cars that these crooks are out there targeting. For example, the Toyota Prius, which I've done these public speaking for a long time and people always want to know where their car is on the... Uh, the, the, you know, the most stolen and, and some little old person will raise their hand and say, I have a Prius. I'm like, no. They're like, well, what do you mean no? No one's ever going to steal your car. Nobody wants a Prius. No one's going to steal it. <laughs> but what's happened is, is the Priuses now are on the top of the list because they have three catalytic converters on them and their catalytic converters are actually very valuable. Um, the other vehicles, that the Prius and the, the Toyota Tundra flip-flop is being number one. Nationwide, I would probably say the Prius. Everyone in California drives one and they're having, this is a worldwide problem, by the way. I, I've got videos of, of people stealing catalytic converters off of cars in Heathrow Airport in London or even in Russia. I mean, this is everywhere. They're, I mean, crooks have just figured out, well, you know, I can cut these off and take them from metal recyclers. So the Toyota Tundra has four catalytic converters. So remember when I told you that you know some of them are worth 40 bucks and some are worth about 1500 bucks? Guess which ones the Tundra have on them? <laughs> yeah, guess what kind of vehicle I own personally? <laughs> a Toyota Tundra. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the, the, and I actually looked under mine when all this started. I was curious. I'm like, okay, why is a Tundra targeted? And I kind of just bent down and looked underneath mine, and I realized like, wow, they're very accessible, um, and they're they're both you know they're about this far away from each other. I, cut them off and I've got two on each side and go to the other side and cut the other ones. Um, so these guys are making good money at it. Um, my, my friend here, uh, Officer Gomez, is going to talk more about what, it's actually a separate division than us, the, the metal uh, theft unit of burglary and theft is actually going to talk about what the city is going to do or what they're in the process of doing, the laws they're trying to get changed. Um, how they're trying to tighten up, because that's the question I always get asked. It's like, how come you guys don't go after the guys who are buying these, these Cadillac converters? And then he's, he's going to actually go into a little more into depth of, of what we're actually doing. So the Cadillac converters, we had uh, last year, we were at, um, I think there was about little, little over 1,800 of them stolen in, in all of last year. So in the first four months of this year, I didn't have May added in yet and June's not out yet. So the first four months, we've had about 1,400. So we're almost at the whole year's worth in just the first four months. For example, like last, the February of, of 2020, we had like 67 stolen. And this year it was like 400. So we're up, you know, between 350 and over 400% increase in the thefts of the catalytic converters. Now, here's the kicker. So when I, when I got this assignment to become a catalytic converter expert, I went up to um, the Fred Haas Toyota. That's where I had bought my truck at, Luetta and 45. And I asked to talk to the service manager and I said, so I explained who I was and what I was doing. And I said, I'm just curious if, if I had a Prius and my catalytic converters have been stolen, there's three on there. I said, what would be the repair bill? And she said uh, it starts at $3,500 and goes up to about $7,000, depending on how much damage they do. When they get up underneath these vehicles, they just chop. They chop through fuel lines, brake lines, uh, O2 sensors that are actually screwed into them. So, so they actually can do quite a bit of damage. So you're talking 
3,500 to 7,000. I said, okay, well, I have a Tundra. Uh, how much is a Tundra to repair? She goes, if all four are gone on the Tundra, the repair bill starts at $7,000 and goes over $10,000. I was like, whoa. So, but she goes, that's not it. That's not the whole thing. She goes, she goes there's a back order. She goes, we can't even get Cadillac converters to replace them. Your vehicle will be sitting here on a lot for over three months. So I'm like, wow. So I had to figure out, okay, well, what are we going to do to prevent it? You know, if I, this is what's going to happen. This is what's happening. Everybody's doing it. The, so let me go back to the list. Uh, the Prius, the Tundra, they flip flop back and forth. The, um, the Toyota Sequoia is actually a Tundra. It's just the SUV version. Uh, the Toyota Tacoma, uh, the small, smaller truck, and then the Forerunner. The Forerunner and the Tundra are the Tacoma are the same vehicle. The thing about the Tacoma is anybody who's got a Tacoma, this is, I want you to share this information with friends and family who might have these vehicles. Um, they always hit the fuel lines on the Tacomas. I don't know why, it's something about placement where it is. And they come out and people are like, yeah, there was a big fuel pile underneath my car and that's what clued me in. Um, and then after those four vehicles, the, the Honda CRV, which is a very popular vehicle, the Honda Element, and then they switched to the three-quarter ton trucks, the F-250s, three-quarter ton Dodge Chevys. With the, uh, the, the U-Haul places, Ryder, Penske, I've been out to all their corporate meetings. Um, they're actually, uh, you know, welding uh, rebarb cages underneath their vehicles and, and, and painting them. In the city, that, I mean, you all saw the news last night. There was a big story about this. It actually happened last December. I don't know why they called my office and said, well, yeah, we need the stats. I heard the city got hit for a bunch of, the city has a lot of Priuses apparently. I didn't know that, but apparently they do. And uh, somebody got into one of our lots and, and stole a whole yeah. bunch of Prius um, Cadillac converters. But that was like last, Jan last December. And since then, we have um, you know, spray paint. All of ours are real bright orange now. So really what I want, I'm going to show you a couple of videos that I did, some prevention videos, all the news media is showing it. And then um, also Inside Edition came. I'm going to show you the clip we did with them about what we can do to kind of um, prevent this that my frustration in this and it comes um not only i mean i i i'm not allowed to get political but you know our our, our judges and our, our da and, and this is considered a property crime you know so to so to say there's very little or no consequences is not really exaggerating even my upper management the stars in this room you know they look at it's a property crime you know and, and that, it frustrates me because I deal with these people one-on-one. -on -one. And when, you know, for most of us in here, we lose our car or, you know, a $10,000 repair bill, you know, I have insurance. You know, most of you probably have insurance. You know, $500 deductible, you know, you're back in business. You know, you might have to wait three months. But, you know, for a lot of people in this city, you know, losing your vehicle the way you get to work is, is life-changing. You know, so so it is frustrating for me when when I hear, oh, it's just a property crime. And, you know, it's not given a lot of priority. You know, especially in the court system, that these bad guys don't, and they know that. I mean, you know, they're making you know a, a lot of money, and you know, they get caught you know once a month or whatever. And they, you know, we've we've arrested quite a few people, and uh, you know, they 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 get right back. They're in for about eight, twelve hours, and you know, if they got to do it once a month, the kind of money they're making, it doesn't really affect them at all. So. Do we give up? No. The only thing we can do is harden our targets, honestly. That's, that's what my message is. That's what I've been out you know, preaching to everybody who will listen, um, is we have to harden our targets. And that is, um, is, is, is marking them. Cadillac converters have no markings. It's getting underneath your car and actually engraving you know, the last eight numbers of your VIN number, your license plate number, and then spray painting it. Get some high temperature paint you know, paint it yellow, pink, whatever color you want, but high temperature paint. And then um, what that does is, is when we're at the metal, when we're at the metal scrappers and, and we see a guy bring in a, a, a truck bed full of Cadillac converters and he's got a yellow one in there, that's gonna alert our guy, hey, let me see that one. And then we're gonna search that one over, look for some numbers. And then we've got, we've got him in possession of a stolen property. So that's gonna really help us out a lot. And the whole idea is, is these metal recyclers, when somebody starts bringing painted ones in, they're gonna turn them away. They're not gonna have a place to sell them. So that's why we want everybody, you know, underneath their vehicles, you know, it, it, I know people 
obviously it's not an option for some people. If you got a mechanic friend or even head into a muffler shop and say, hey, how much would you charge me to do it? Um, we're actually gonna try to set up a program to partner up with some businesses where that service can be provided, you know, with a partnership with the Houston Police Department. And that's something we're working on. It's just such a huge city and, and getting corporate, like, you know, Meineke Muffler, well, it has to come from corporate to be able to do that. So we're working on that now for places that would actually offer that service for free. So um, stay tuned. I'll definitely be putting that information out. So um, with that, I'm going to show you, um, I don't know what order they are, but I have two videos I'm going to show you real quick. You know, if most, a lot of you in here know me, I will talk for three hours. So, I mean, somebody in the back room is already doing this, like... <laughs> And some of you have heard me talk that long before. <laughs> but when we were doing the Zoom thing, oh my God, that was horrible. Go down the open hyperlink. Up, up, nope. I'll be right back. This is um there's okay. There we go. Hi, I'm sorry to page for the Houston Police Department involved in the crime task force. You're probably wondering why am I coming to you today for wondering if the truck. It's because of these right here. This is your Cadillac murder. The theft of these parts off of vehicles is up over three hundred percent compared to last year. What they're doing is taking these things to the metal recyclers and getting cash money for them. So what we're going to talk about today is things you can do to help prevent you from becoming a victim of this. One of the prevention tips that's very inexpensive is simply purchasing a small engraving tool and engraving your, the last eight of your VIN number or at least your license plate number into the catalytic converter. And secondly, is actually taking some high temperature paint, a real bright color, and spraying the entire catalytic converter. And what this is good for is that if we find these crooks with these catalytic converters at a scrapyard, when we find these painted ones, we're going to actually search for numbers and print it on those, and then hopefully get an arrest on that. And one of the reasons why this is such a big problem is the cost of repairs. These Toyota Tundras, for example, are costing more than $10,000 to repair. And another problem is, is the back order. There's a back order on these parts that most dealerships here in town are over three months long. Let's start with some basic, simple prevention tips. Number one, parking in a well-lit area. Using your garage. And then, get online, Google Catalytic Converter Prevention. You're gonna find some products like this. This product here is actually a steel cable that wraps around your catalytic converter and actually glues itself. It's heat activated, glues itself, and it comes with a motion detector that goes underneath your car. This one here is actually a steel wire cage that actually wraps around your catalytic converter, makes it a whole lot harder for the thieves to actually saw through them. And then, covering your catalytic converters, this one right here is made for a Toyota Prius, which is one of our top you know, vehicles that are being targeted. But they also make these at four-wheel drive parts places for almost every truck as you just bolt it to the bottom of your vehicle. What we want you to do is etch it, paint it, and cover it. And that will help prevent you from becoming a victim. Etch it, paint it, cover it. I, I trademark that, do not copy that. <laughs> Hey guys, good morning. Colby from MufflerTech, PriusCats.com, and StolenCats.com again. Today, this is the inside. It's piece. a new crime wave around the world. Only five million people watch this sneaking oh, underneath people's cars, and as Lisa Guerrero reports, what they're walking away with sells for big bucks. It's a crime wave sweeping the country. Crooks jacking up cars and sliding underneath with electric saws. What are they after? Your catalytic converter. This is a catalytic converter. It reduces the amount of pollution coming out of your car. Thefts have gone through the roof because the value of some of the materials that go into making this auto part have skyrocketed. Those precious items? Palladium, $2,900 an ounce. 
rhodium, $27,900 an ounce. And this happens in broad daylight, all within 15, 20 minutes, and poof, they're gone. Fernando Villalo was shocked when he discovered this guy scoping out his Honda Accord. There were two people, they pulled right next to my car, one uh, was the leader doing the operation, and one stood in guard. They used a portable power saw and cut the converter out. There it is in his hands. They jump back into the car and off they go. The crime wave has hit Houston hard. Catalytic converters are being stolen by the trunk loads. In the first four months of this year, theft is up 500%. Theft is not out of control just in Houston. It's everywhere in the U.S. I spent two days with Sergeant Tracy Hicks of Houston's Auto Crimes Task Force as we tracked catalytic converter theft. We just got hit with four catalytic converters on the road. 20 catalytic converters were stolen overnight here in Houston. So we're following the sergeant to talk to some of those victims. Brittany Burns recently started her car and heard this. Oh, wow. Wow. The thousand dollar price tag for a new converter is causing havoc in her life. I'm in the process of trying to find a job right now, and it's hard to get to and from if I can't use my car. Steve and Karen Adams had their converter stolen for the second time. What's the process going to be like to replace it? It's, it's going to be a while before we get it fixed, and the one is hard to find the parts right now because this is happening so much. Oh my god! So what can you do from becoming the next victim? Sergeant Hicks recommends you get your mechanic to spray paint it a bright color. This makes it harder for thieves to sell stolen goods and get a protective shield to cover your converter. Good tips to prevent this from happening. And one more tip is to have the mechanic etch the last eight characters of your VIN number onto the converter so that if it is stolen, they can track that thing down. That was my famous national news. Uh, <laughs> autographs. Afterwards, I'll be in the back. Um, so what um, those stories, we actually went around, and th those were citizens here in Houston. Uh, Brittany, um, you know, single mom, she had three kids. It was funny because the producer of the show, I was just like rolling my eyes. They were from New York. They weren't really Houston savvy. And um, he goes, he goes, yeah, let's go out to your car. He goes, bring one of your babies. I was like, oh, Jesus, that sounded bad. But I'm like, they're not props, you know. But, um, yeah, so she, she had lost her job, and, uh, or, or she couldn't go and get a job. She didn't, her, hers had been hit like a week and a half, or like 10 days before we went out there and actually talked to her. Um, we, were, we actually had a few other people we were going to interview we didn't get to. Uh, one guy I had talked to, he, it was, uh, they had gotten here uh, on a Wednesday uh, Tuesday night, his Cadillac converters were stolen off of his Tundra, and I said, "Hey, can we come out and talk to you?" He goes, "Well, I'm working all day. I can't meet you till later." I said, "I said, well, you know, what what was the repair bill?" He goes, "He goes, no, that's not the story." He goes, "I just got my truck out of the shop Friday, that, for getting his Cadillac converters replaced." He goes, and he goes, "I'm hoping the police don't pull me because you see what it hurt, what it sounds like. It's real loud." He said, I hope the police don't pull me over because he delivers parts for a dealership and he had to make money in his truck so he could do it again. You know, and, and, and he was like 26 years old. So, you know, it's hard to swallow and you, oh, it's just a property crime. It's, you know, people have insurance. It's, well, it's, it's life changing for a lot of people. So, like I said, back to what I was telling you about, it's, it's hard in the targets. You know, that's all we can do. And I've been telling officers this, too. You know, a lot of us, I mean, I have officers call me up. I have a Tundra. What should I do? Um, like I said, my, I have a Tundra, too. Those, those uh, skid plates, you know, the metal plates they put on the bottom, if you have an SUV or a truck, they like the trucks because they don't have to jack them up. So the Priuses and stuff, the newer Priuses, if you have a brand new one, they're not stolen as much because of they, they've actually been relocated or more in the engine bay now. And they didn't do that because they're stolen. They did it because apparently the closer they are to the engine, the better they work. So, um, Like I said, I could talk all night, but I have Officer Gomez here. He's going to explain kind of more what the metal theft unit, the metal theft unit, um, was originally, you know, what the people, the, the crackheads stealing the copper from the AC units. Well, now they've basically just 
all hands on deck. It's it's these uh, catalytic converters and what they're doing and uh, and, and trying to uh, combat the crime with with regulations and, and trying to keep a rein in on where these guys are actually purchasing. Good deal. And I'll be in the back for autographs and handshakes for later. Good evening. My name is Officer Gomez. Uh, first, before I came out to the uh, uh, police academy, I served in the Marine Corps for 13 years. Um, I was a gunnery sergeant, uh, and uh, then I decided to need a change of career, so I came to Houston. I was class 154, um, and I trained at North Shepherd. I worked night shift in North Shepherd, working in gang task force in North Shepherd. Then I came to burglary and theft, and the opportunity was presented to create, and this new squad that they were creating, and I joined it in 2006, and I've been here ever since. <clears throat> so the objectives of my presentation is basically to introduce you to the metal theft unit, um, what we do, and uh, just let you know what we do with, uh, with the scrap metal businesses. So officially it was created in 2007. Uh, at the time, there was only one sergeant and one officer. Uh, we grew to having four additional officers and uh, a lieutenant. Um, during that time frame, what we did is we updated the city ordinance. It was an outdated. It was, we had uh, our, our policies and everything that we were supposed to be enforcing, but nobody was actually enforcing it until we came aboard. The scrap metal business at that time basically just did whatever they, they would wish. If they wanted to report, they reported. If they didn't, they didn't report. <clears throat> when we first created the squad, uh, there was 135 scrap metal businesses. We are now down to 89 scrap metal businesses. Some of them were lost during uh, uh, COVID, but most of them were basically our efforts of uh, over regulating them and pushing them out into the county or just out of business period. Um, so that's, we've we got a really good relationship with the scrap metal businesses, uh, but there's still some some need, changes that need to be, be occurring. So the tool that we use is called Lease Online. It's an independent database that uh, is based out of Houston, uh, Dallas. What they're responsible for doing is collecting all data from scrap metal businesses. They do all the ponds and all the scrap metal businesses. There are requirements that are set by the city ordinance that they're gonna submit to Lease Online. We can go on Lease Online and we can see what's being reported to Lease Online. Um, and we keep daily tabs on certain scrap yards that are causing problems and whatever. Whenever we have uh, material that we're looking for, we go to Lisa online, try to find out who's selling it, where they're selling at, and uh, hopefully we find stuff. That's why it's important for you guys to mark your catalytic converters, because one of the things that they have to do at the scrapyard is actually take a photograph of the item they purchase. So when I see five plain catalytic converters and one fluorescent yellow, that draws my attention. That means I gotta go out there and investigate that one particular uh, catalytic converter. And this is basically what uh, was reported 2000, uh, 2019 and uh, first part of uh, 2020. If you see, it's got a, a lot of personal information on there as to who's bringing the, the catalytic converter. Uh, there's a picture of what they're bringing, the person that sold it, they paid him in cash, and then there's his driver license and his thumbprint, as well as a signature saying that he is a rightful owner of the material and he's got the right to sell it. So that's what pulls up into a scrapyard. An individual, 19, 20 years old, loaded down with scrap, or in this case, catalytic converters, and nobody questions that. That's not right. 
So uh, the first change that we did to the, to the city ordinance is um, for every catalytic converter that you brought in, you have to prove a documentation that that catalytic converter belonged to a vehicle. And that's what they did. So you see the catalytic converters there, and then you see a copy of the documentation that they're supposed to provide. I still have issues with that there because it's all uh, uh, computer generated except for one item, and that is the VIN number of the, of the vehicle. So basically, they're just going to copy and they're just burning a copy off, and they're meeting the requirements. This particular scrap metal business is actually in the county. So um, this is a recent transaction. This is more in the compliance to the changes that we made uh, recently. The change is already taking effect in the city of Houston. It does not go into effect in the county or in the state of Texas until September 1st when the state law takes into effect. Still, they bring a, a whole bunch of them, but now they're required to individually photograph each one of them. Every side has to be photographed. So if it's a flat one, you gotta turn it one side, turn it the other side, and both openings need to be recorded. You still need documentation on them, but if you see this one, they have serial numbers or, or markings on them, they need to be recorded as well. We have to have all that information. So there's the, the photograph of all the material that, in a, in, that came out for one vehicle, and you can see that's the, uh, the catalytic converter actually has a, a marking on it, it has a serial number on it, and they gotta, they gotta collect that information. So when you mark your catalytic converters, it'll be high pink or yellow, and you'll have your license plate number on it, plus you have that information on it. It makes it easier for us to find out that it came off of your vehicle, and we have the information of the seller because they're required by city law, uh, city ordinance and state law. So who's actually selling this stuff? Well, um, in 2019, there was only eight suspects that we actually identified as, as selling. Um, only one was actually charged, and as you can see, it has not gone to court yet. We're still pending on that one individual from two years ago. 2020, we had 27 individuals that we identified as sellers at scrap metal businesses. We had eight that are, have open warrants because we charged them and they failed to show up in court. Uh, four that was dismissed by the prosecutor, apparently they didn't think we had enough evidence. Uh, two actually pled guilty and served their time and they're now back out. We have eight that are pending uh, court and uh, five that again, there was not sufficient evidence for us to charge them. Basically, that's the, those are the ones that patrol stops. They got a trunk load of cattle know where they came from. So we identify everything, they do a report. We try to find out where, if anybody's uh, reporting their we can't identify it, then it just goes that we don't have enough evidence. So, so far in uh, 2021, we identified 45, three have open warrants, uh, 33 have pending court cases, and seven we did not have enough evidence to charge them with. <clears throat> So this is some of the changes that uh, happened to the, the chapter seven, which is the city ordinance. And basically what it is, is that you can do a transaction from a business to a business. You have to provide documentation that you are a legit business, whether it be a muffler shop, um, you know, a salvage yard, whatever you are, you gotta provide that information to, to, the, uh, to the seller or, or to the scrap metal business. And they have to be on file. <clears throat> Um, documentation, like I said, photographs of all the material, every angle um, and everything. The one thing that is interesting, if you see the yellow highlighted, uh, if you're paying more than $25, you gotta write them a check. You cannot give them the check. The check needs to be sent to their home record or on their ID. So if they have a bad ID, they're never gonna get their check. The only other option is that after three days, you come back to the scrap yard and collect your money. So no more quick cash for uh, scrap for uh, stealing catalytic converters. After about two more minutes. Okay. 
some of the changes in the, in the uh, uh, house bill that, that uh, occurred is basically the same thing. We were not able to get every, everything that we wanted. We didn't get the, the payment. Uh, we did get uh, the uh, photographs of the material and everything, but the main thing that I wanted was the, uh, the payment, and we, did not, we were not able to get that. Uh, there was a lot of resistance from the industry itself outside of Houston and uh, other departments, so we just lost on that one. That's my information right there. Um, you can reach me at, that, at my office number or my email. Email is probably the, the, the best uh, way of communication. Any questions? Yes, sir. Have y'all worked with the car manufacturers on posting the VIN numbers or etching them onto the catalytic converters when they make the cars? Sorry, Nick. Uh, we have not. Um, I just wondered if, any, if anyone has. Not, not to my knowledge, I don't think anybody has actually worked with it. Uh, or put a case You know, um, I've experienced the same thing with, uh, with wire, uh, where uh, we suggested that they get the company name on the wire or whatever to make it easier, but the manufacturers of the wire refuse to do that because they lose money on that. So it just seems like they could etch the VIN number on when they make the cars. They have hidden over. Yeah. But um, it hasn't happened. One more question. Anybody? Thank you, Oscar. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, don't move till we get through this. <laughs> On behalf of the citywide board and the divisional VIP officers and the entire command staff, we would like to say thank you to the PIP members that are here this evening, also the officers, meaning HPD and the fire department. And you're involved in your neighborhoods and the PIP program basically is crime prevention. Please don't forget that. So, if you have the time, you get involved. If you don't have the time, you make the time. It's your neighborhood and it is your city and you are the eyes and ears, so please be very alert. If you see anything that is absolutely not correct, you know what to do. Thank you all for coming this evening, and we will see you at our next meeting on September 14th, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you all.